Welcome to the Apologetics Guy Show, the podcast that helps you find clear answers to tough questions about God, Jesus, and the Bible, and then be able to turn around and explain your faith with both courage and compassion. I'm Dr. Mikel Del Rosario. I'm your apologetics guy and the host of this podcast. And this is actually the very first time that I'm recording in downtown Chicago, here where I teach apologetics, philosophy, and Bible classes at Moody Bible Institute. And I'm really excited about our topic and our guest today, because on this episode, we're talking about some ways to make the case for God and Christianity, but we're going to do it in a way that few podcasts have ever come at it, and that is by looking at key lessons from the very first woman to publish an apologetics book. She's an 18th century philosopher named Susanna Newcomb. And my guest, who's actually the one who brought this unsung hero of apologetics to my attention, is Sarah Enterlein. Sarah is the founder of the International Society of Women in Apologetics. And in 2016, she became an apologist with the Library of Historical Apologetics. And she's also the author of a book called No Apologies, The Life and Work of Susanna Newcomb. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. I know we talked about having you on for a while and uh, <laughs> yes. you know, life <laughs> stuff yes. happens and uh, we finally made it happen though. So I'm really glad you're here. Yeah. Well, before we dive into our topic today, I want to ask you just to share a little bit about your story. How did you get involved in this whole world of defending the faith? Um, I guess I kind of started in high school. I was sitting in a science class. I went to public school my whole life, but I also grew up in church. So I was kind of that kid that went to Sunday school, but also was getting the influences of public school education. Um, but I was sitting in a high school science class, uh, biology, and we were going over evolution. And I kept, of course, being the, the good Christian kid, challenging my teacher constantly. And uh, one day he gave me a um, pile of Bible contradictions and said, if I could mm. explain those and if I could e explain to him how those work, um, that they're not contradictions, then he would listen to what I had to say. And okay, I'm 15 at this point, And there mm. aren't books like how to answer you know, a thousand and one answers to Bible contradictions. Like those books did not exist at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, it kind of started me on this journey of, do I really believe this? How do, how do you answer these contradictions? How, how, you know, like, what do I do with this? Um, and then, so kind of started getting into, um, just really for looking for myself about why I was a Christian and, um, just kind of started diving in and realized I kind of had a knack for, um, Bible and theology. Um, and then when I got out of high school, I decided that I wanted to go to Bible college, um, so that I could kind of get more knowledge and, didn't really know what else I want to do with my life. So I was like, Bible college, I guess, is where I'm going. Um, and it just so happened that I met um, my mentor there. Um, he actually wrote the forward to my book. And he told me, um, I, I was one, in one of his classes, and he's like, you should be an apologist. And I was like, well, what is that? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> And he kind of explained, you know, what it was. And I said, well, can women even do that? Is that something a woman could do? Um, and he just kept encouraging me. And so um, I went through Bible college and um, decided to go to seminary uh, to do apologetics, to focus on apologetics. And in seminary, um, I was sitting there and I kind of looked around the room and, and I was one of like three women in the entire program. Hmm. And I was wondering, you know, okay, women can do this, but is it something I can ever like support a family with? Is it something that I'm ever going to make money at? If not, then what the heck am I doing here? Putting myself into debt in seminary when I don't know if this is going to even work for me. So um, basically what happened is I happened to be in Dr. Norman Geisler's class and I went up to him and I said, um, is this worth it for me? Like, should I even be doing this? Should I continue? And he just encouraged me and he said, well, mm -hmm. here's a list of women that are doing this and are doing it really well and are professors and they're publishing and they're doing all these things. And I was like, wow. And so he gave me this list of six women. And um, so I reached out to all of them. One of them was Nancy Piercy. One of them was Mary Jo Sharp um, and just said, you know, you should reach out to these women and, and see kind of what they have to say. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how our group got started, our, our women in apologetics group. And ever since then, it's just kind of been, I mean, it's been hard you know being a woman in apologetics it's not easy um but uh 
I feel like the Lord has just opened doors and given me opportunities. He's really blessed um, the fact that I've kind of put all my eggs in this basket. Um, and, uh, and yeah. And so here I am, I just kept getting opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> so now here I am, you know, 20 plus years later and still doing it. So. Wow. So this is quite a journey before you put out your first book. Yes. Um, <laughs> I remember it was so good meeting you at Dallas Seminary back in the day. Mm. It's about a decade now or uh, uh, yeah, yeah. seven years or something time. like that. Uh, when I remember you were on campus and we got to take a look uh -huh. at some manuscripts together yes. um, in the special collections area where they just let researchers in. So I'm glad that we got to at least do that while you were on campus. Um, but yes. what got you started in researching the contribution of women to apologetics? Um, well, obviously, the whole idea of women being in apologetics was kind of already something that I had been looking at. Um, but you could have, you know, like I said, bl blown me over with a small breeze um, when I found out that women did it before, like Dorothy Sayers. Like, I thought Dorothy Sayers being part of the Inklings, I thought she was kind of the first one. Um, but then um, I, Tim McGrew actually asked me to come on and work with the Library of Historical Apologetics. And he sent me all these works by women um, from the 18th and 19th centuries. And it opened up an entire world to me that I didn't even know existed. Women were doing this and publishing all these things, making these arguments for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but before Susanna Newcomb, which was, she published in 1728, it doesn't appear as though there were any women publishing. There were obviously women who we know were intelligent, who we know were probably making the case in their personal life and their personal evangelism. You've got the mystics and the nuns and people from the Reformation and, and, and the Catholic Church, but um, you don't really see specific apologetic arguments being made until Susanna. Um, mm -hmm. And so Tim gave me the honor of going through these women and researching them. And so now um, they're becoming a series of books <laughs> because mm. I think they're, they're too fascinating to me to not share with the world. So how did Susanna in particular get on your radar as you were doing your work? Did something stand out to you or how did you discover her? Um, well, again, she was part of that group of women that we were given. We were working on a, a project with Oxford University and she was a, um, uh, just a, a group of women's writings that we were given. And she stood out to me because she was the earliest. And so I was like, I wonder, you know, thinking maybe the earliest is a little bit more primitive, not, not as well fleshed out maybe as later arguments, but it actually is the opposite. <laughs> She's mm -hmm. actually got some of the best fleshed out arguments being the earliest um, as compared to some of the later ones, because I think mm -hmm. what happened is the later ones started realizing that there was so much on the market, they didn't have to be as detailed and as specific, they could really um, be more general because the people were more familiar with those terms, whereas Suzanne is very specific, She's, she outlines her terms, she defines her terms, um, and I think the one thing that stood out to me was just that she, just the way she did, she was very systematic, she mm -hmm. She defined her terms and then she just very logically lays it out and, and each argument builds on the previous argument and just the way that she did it, it was at this stage in history for women to be doing that kind of systematic apologetics is, is mm -hmm. that was a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. So I think that her systematic method, um, the obvious choice that she was a woman writing at a time where women weren't encouraged to do that, um, she wrote anonymously. So the fact that she didn't want to take credit for her work. Um, was a big thing for me. Um, and then also just kind of, uh, just the why she did it, I guess, is my, is my thing is she, in, in the beginning, you read that she's, she's hurt and she's, she's devastated by the fact that she's seen deism, this enlightenment view, lead these people away who just didn't know any better. And so her goal was to write a book to the average lay person. Now, nowadays, when you read her book, um, it's not to the, the lay person nowadays, <laughs> but lay mm -hmm. people back then, they were reading books and, and in language, they, they had a much more, um, a ver much more verbose vocabulary, I guess you could say. They, they, were, they were on par with these terms that these scholars were using regularly. And so when she's writing to a lay person back then, um, it's very different than how you write to a lay person now, but it is very clear that that's her heart. She's writing mm -hmm. to the average person so that they will have some clear understanding of these arguments saying that, that God 
um, doesn't reveal himself and he doesn't care about you and he didn't send Jesus and those things. She just has a heart to clear those up with people. And I think that I resonated with that. Um, sometimes as an intelligent Christian or somebody that you kind of get stuck in books and you live in your head a lot, you um, tend to forget the heart and the people on the other side of the conversation. And I love that she just made it clear that no, even though I'm about to go very systematically through this, my heart is to reach the people that are being deceived. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's why I resonated with her. Yeah. Well, well, she's kind of the first lady of apologetics then, huh? If she's the very first yes. one published, right? Yes. Uh, I yes. Think one thing that stood out to me, just kind of a small thing because I'm a missionary kid um, and I know a lot of my friends are PKs, pastors, kids, is that she was mm -hmm. a PK yes, as well. Yes, she was. <laughs> and uh, her yes, dad was... She was. Her dad was an Anglican priest in England, and you actually got mm -hmm. to see where she was buried in Cambridge, right? Tell us mm -hmm. about how that well, happened. Yeah, so um, just doing all this research, you know, it's hard living in Southern California and not having um, access to uh, the actual documents and and actually being able to go there and, and seeing, is this real? Did this really happen? You know, or someone mm -hmm. like trying to pull the wool over my eyes. As a historian and as a history teacher, I'm constantly telling my students, you have to always back everything up with evidence. Mm -hmm. We can say something happened in history, but until we really know, until we can see it, you know, we don't really know. And so um, I decided one day, I was like, you know what? I really, I feel like I need to do this. I need to go and I need to kind of retrace her steps. I need to kind of see what her life was like. Otherwise I didn't feel like I could write about her well. So um, we, my husband and I took a trip to England and we actually went to, um, the, the place where her father's church is, it's still standing. Um, and we went to, so we went to where she was, the area where she was born. We went to the church where she was baptized, went to her father's church. Uh, we went to where she lived in Cambridge. We went to where she was buried in Cambridge. So we visited, um, you know, all, we went to the church where she was married uh, mm. to her husband in London. And so we, I visited all the key parts of her life. Um, and I was able to get documents from the London archives and take pictures. And so um, I really feel like for me, that was, that was important for me to be able to do that, to, to do justice, to say, yes, it's there. This really happened. This incredible woman really lived. Um, and, and it was, it was an experience. It was very irreverent moment for me to go to her grave and just, you know, just to kind of thank her for, for paving, paving the way for the rest mm. of us. Uh, well, first, yes, let's uh, appreciate how Susanna was creating apologetics content a lot earlier than most people <laughs> think women were writing yes. apologetics works, you know, this back in the 1700s. Um, right. Let's talk about some of her actual arguments, and we'll okay. just touch on a couple of her uh, key areas of her book, um, her arguments for the existence of God. How right. did she make the case and say that the universe points us to God? Um, what I love about her is that she just went straight to physics. <laughs> she, she basically said, look, if there's an effect, there has to be a cause. Um, and she didn't even really use, um, you know, like we think of William Lane Craig, let's say as the kind of godfather of the cosmological argument for modern apologetics. Um, but when we look at people who are using it before, they were using not the words cosmological, but they were using the idea of cause and effect, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of something that, you know, um, just were basic laws of physics. And so she uses the idea that, look, if everything you see around you exists, it's an effect, which means that there has to be a cause. Um, and so she just, very, she just does it so logically and so simply the idea anybody can understand the idea of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she also talks about the fact that, um, the world shows that it's not eternal. That when you look mm -hmm. at the way the world works and, and how, um, you know, that she talks about the second law of thermodynamics and entropy and all that. And she talks about how, um, the world can't be eternal. And if it's not eternal, then it had to have a beginning. And if it had a beginning, then who was the beginner? How did it start? Mm -hmm. um, so she so she uses cause and effect. She uses the fact that the world's not eternal. And then she also uses the idea of the laws of inertia, the idea that um, the unmoved mover, um, mm -hmm. basically like if there was ever nothing, then nothing is all there would ever be. Because in order for something to move or something to start, there has to mm -hmm. be a mover or a starter, the idea of the unmoved mm -hmm. mover. Yeah. And so, um, so those are the, really the ones she leans on. She, she, and I love that she leans on science. She leans on physics. She leans on inertia. She leans on gravity and cause and effect. And um, so really, she really leans very much on science when she's making her case for um, 
God being or there being have to be a cause of the universe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love how she just appeals to common sense and uh, you know, <laughs> yes. in a way that like anyone can get. Um, yes. but it really does sound like she's almost foreshadowing some of the modern presentations mm-hmm. that we see from, like you mentioned, people like William Lane Craig, yeah. his presentation of the Kalam cosmological argument, which sometimes we say cosmological, like C-A-U-S-E, logical, yeah, right, just right. to help people remember it. It's a cause <laughs> yes. and effect kind of thing, right? right? And just for those who are listening who are uh, maybe not as familiar with William Lane Craig's work, his presentation is just to say, number one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. And it's not just that, oh, well, whatever exists has a cause. It's everything right. that begins to exist has right. a cause. And we know that uh-huh. the universe began to exist. Those are the two premises. And therefore, the conclusion is that, therefore, the universe has a cause. Mm-hmm. So then people will go, okay, so maybe maybe there is a cause, but why right. is that God? Why can't that just be like anything, like random chance? Right, like aliens or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. He talks about how the cause is either personal or impersonal. And I know Mm -hmm. Susanna does some of that as well, talking about the cause has to be free and intelligent. How does she get there? Um, Well, I think that she just kind of knew that was the next question. I mean, she's very good at understanding what begs a question. And so I think she knew like, okay, if I put this premise out there, the next thing I'm going to get asked is this follow-up question. So how do I answer that follow-up question? And so um, when you assert that there's a God or a cause, let's say, Mm -hmm. you also have to explain, okay, what kind of cause is that? Because like you said, it could be any cause. There's lots of different ideas people have about what the cause was. Um, And so the idea is that, well, what kind of cause is it? Because her end goal is to prove that it's the God of Christianity. So what she does is she says, okay, well, this cause has to have these 12 attributes well, isn't it so nice that those 12 attributes of that cause are also the attributes of the God of Christianity. And so Mm. she, you know, she really just kind of like lays the groundwork saying, well, the cause has to be this. And oh, look, the God of Christianity (laughs) has this, you know, so she's very good about um, setting up the next argument. Um, And I think that's one of the reasons I was so impressed with her. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, she does argue that the cause has to be intelligent. So she really um, way before, you know, Michael Behe goes into the irreducible complexity, hundreds of years ago, she's talking about machines and how do machines work. And if the universe is a giant machine, then, you know, it, and it has to have all of its parts, then it couldn't have evolved. And she talks about the fact that, um, you know, uh, that there's fine tuning in the universe. And so she really gives the case for it needed to be an intelligent cause by leaning on those fine tuning um, and those irreducible complexity arguments um, mm-hmm. by showing the world as a machine and the way that she explains it. At first, when I was reading it in her you know, 18th century language, I was very confused. Um, but once I was able to actually break down what she was saying and really put it in a modern English, I was like, oh, I was like, that's the fine tuning argument. Or that's, mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. was a lot of this book was me just trying to figure out what is she saying? Um, because again, it's just writing in Shakespeare, this, you know, the Shakespearean English. And so for me, here I am trying to decipher apologetics in Shakespearean English. I mean, it's not easy. And so what you mm-hmm. have to do first is translate the Shakespearean English into modern English, which is what I did, and then explain the arguments. So there was a multi-step process to even understanding these arguments, what she was putting forth. And as I'm translating it from the Shakespearean to the modern English, my mind is just being blown over and over Mm -hmm. again with the arguments that she's putting forth because I'm finally recognizing them for what they were. So um, yeah, so she relied on um, fine tuning and um, irreducible complexity, so. Wow. Yeah. Now let's talk about worldviews a little bit. There's a worldview called materialism or naturalism, Uh which is just this idea that the material world is all there is. And, you know, everything that we see can be fully explained just by matter behaving according to law. How did she try to get people to consider that there might be more to reality than just Mm -hmm. what we see, just matter? Yeah. So, well, first of all, when she, before she gets to that place, she is actually, she gives that case for God. So she does give the case Mm -hmm. for there needing to be a cause. So that's the first step in showing people that, look, if there's effects, meaning there's matter, how did the matter get here? 
right? Because it's a cause to that. And then that cause, now what kind of cause is that? So that cause she determines has to be supernatural because it has to be something outside of the matter in order to make the matter appear, right? So it has mm-hmm. to be a God that's external to the things that are being created. So that's her first tactic is she's already given that case. And so then she just relies on that case that, well, look, I've already shown you the type of God it has to be. He has to be supernatural. And if he's supernatural, then guess what? There are things that aren't material. There are things Mm -hmm. that aren't matter. Um, But the second thing she does is she um, shows that there's an afterlife. So Mm. she explains like, look, there's, there's just too much personality. There's just too much personhood in people for this to be all that there is. And so she gives this case that if human beings are made to uh, be satisfied in some way, if human beings have sadness or have some lack of some kind, then there has to be some fulfillment to that lack. And so she talks about the satisfaction of there being an afterlife, the satisfaction of happiness and eternal joy. And she says, if those are real things in human beings, then there has to be some external satisfaction. There has to be some afterlife because if God is just, and people don't get their just due on the earth, there has to be some extended period of time after this life where they get their just due. So for example, if God, if her argument is that God is just and an innocent child or somebody that let's say doesn't deserve um, to have the life that they have on this earth, then there has to be something after that where God is somehow given a chance to rectify or just it or give them justice. So that's where she talks about the idea of eternal reward and the fact that the the justification of having maybe a not so great life here is that you have this incredible eternal life that lasts way longer and is way better than anything mm. you could have had here. And so she basically uses um, her, so she leans on her arguments for there being a cause and that cause having to be supernatural. And then also for the idea that our, there has to be something besides our physical bodies because our physical bodies are not satisfied with this life. And so there has to be another life after this that will satisfy our souls. And so she gives a case for a soul. She gives a case for afterlife. Um, and so um, just basically proves that we were made for something more than this life. Mm. Um, and so I feel like that's how she really shows that there's more than just matter. There's more than just what's here, that there's something beyond here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. She's foreshadowing a lot of arguments that you hear nowadays, <laughs> isn't she? Yeah. Arguments yes. from desire, arguments mm-hmm. from, you know, near death yes. experiences or the evidence yes. for the soul. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing, amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about how now she transitions to uh, talking about Christianity Mm -hmm. and how she argued that Christianity is actually the way that God revealed himself to us. Mm -hmm. How did she do that? So she actually wrote her first edition more about the argument from desire. It was more focused on the idea that she's trying to convince people that there's more to this life and that God's the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But then she read a book um, by Matthew Tyndall, where he argued that uh, we don't need anything beyond creation. Basically, all we need is general revelation. We don't need anything beyond creation in order to um, live a life that will satisfy God's requirements for us. And so um, it's called as Christianity as old as, as creation. And he basically says that natural law is all we need. We don't need any type of supernatural law. We don't need any Jesus. We don't need any Bible. Like it was a way of saying that, oh yes, I can, I can still be a Christian in the sense that I'm going to not side with the evolutionists um, of the, 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 which became popular later, but the idea that, but I don't have to deal with all that morality right? The, the, the stuff that Jesus and the scriptures are imposing on me are not things that I have to deal with. So it was this kind of way of, of acknowledging that, yes, there's a God, but I can live however I want. And she was basically, um, she read his book and then she rewrote her book for a second edition uh, mm. because she felt that she had touched on that a little bit in her first edition, but really was like, no, I need to answer this guy. So um, then she rewrote her second edition and she really showed that um, God didn't just reveal himself through creation. Yes, he did. That's a big part of it. Obviously we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that, but that's not the only way he revealed himself. And not only is that it wasn't enough, God creating wasn't enough that in order for us to live, it was enough for us to know him. It was not enough for us to live a perfectly moral life. And so she explains that basically you need Jesus, you need the scriptures, you need the Holy spirit in order to be able to live in a way that is pleasing to God. 
Mm-hmm. And so um, she basically, the whole work is that she's giving the case for um, Christianity being why, how God revealed himself, because she's answering the fact that people are challenging saying, there's no need for supernatural revelation. There's no need for that because we have general revelation. Mm -hmm. So she's basically giving the case for special revelation in this, because otherwise you'd have to throw out Jesus. You have to throw out the scriptures. And as a Christian, she wasn't willing to do that. So um, she showed that not only is, not only should we not throw out Christianity, but it is the the, the one way that God did reveal himself. Mm -hmm. um, And here's how, right. And then she goes through the case for the scriptures and for Jesus and all that. So, yeah. That sounds like the Apostle Paul very much, doesn't it? Yes, the Mars Hill. Paul starts out, you know, even he's writing Mm -hmm. Romans, you know, uh, 120 that without excuse Mm -hmm. because God has revealed himself through the things that have been made. He's hearkening back to things like Psalm 19, where the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. But then, of course, he's all about his Damascus Road experience where he had the... (laughs) Uh, you know, experience of yes. seeing the risen Jesus himself mm-hmm. and right. uh, goes on to quote that creed in first Corinthians 15 about uh, how mm-hmm. Jesus was crucified and how uh, people saw him risen from the dead. And he outlines the gospel right there. So mm-hmm. yeah. Amazing. And and for me, I felt like it was very much that James 2, James 2, 19, where he says, even the demons believe and tremble. It's like, mm. well, great. Like, it's like Paul with the unknown God. He's like, great. You've acknowledged it. It's there but there's more to the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where she was at. It's like, yes, there is general revelation. However, there's more to it. Yeah. Yeah. And so was deism then the main thing that she was challenging in Mm -hmm. her, her cultural context? She, yeah, she was living in England at the height of the enlightenment during when deism really started to become, because it was deism. And then that, and then after her, it really led to the Darwinian evolution and all that, because he came about a hundred years later, but um, deism was really, she was fighting Hume, um, people like that. And so, um, or not Hume, but like Hume's ideas, you know? And so I really feel like, um, deism was really it really was the focus and it was she even admits that she's specifically answering matthew tyndall's work so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now for those who aren't familiar with deism how would you quickly define what that is (laughs) uh god wound up the universe and let it go and he has no interaction with us basically someone created us but there's no interaction after that so um i'd like a like a wind-up toy you wind it up and then you just kind of let it um, let it run its course or whatever. But, but then again, if you hold to that, then there's, you can't accept anything after that. So no Jesus, basically there is no God interceding in mankind. It's just God winding up history and starting it, but then he has nothing to do with it after that. He's all completely transcendent. There's no eminence, meaning he, there's no interaction with human beings. There's no, um, sending Jesus, there's no saving us from our sins. Right. And so then that Mm -hmm. was another question she brought up. Well, then how are we saved if, you know, so, um, so yeah, deism is really the idea that God started everything, but then doesn't interact with us at all, has no relationship with human beings. Yeah. Well, the story of Christianity is that God has uh, entered right. into our <laughs> world, and in Jesus, He has been redeeming people and drawing people to Himself. Um, even when we cared nothing about God, that God right. actually took the initiative to reach out yes. to us. And so Jesus mm-hmm. is God with us. Um, I love how she talked about Jesus is the Messiah. You know, that was a big part mm-hmm. of my dissertation is looking at Jesus' yeah. claims, especially in Mark 14, when He's asked straight up, Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Right. He says, yes. Um, also, the idea I like that she wrote how basically nobody dies for a lie that they know right. isn't true. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that's yes. modern day apologetics you hear a yes. lot. Um, yes. Why would the disciples die for saying that Jesus rose from the dead? Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it was Josh McDowell, I think, who said um, yes. that liars make poor martyrs. Right. Um, <laughs> And I'll plug my friend Sean McDowell's work on the fate of the apostles if you want to take Mm -hmm. a look at the actual historical evidence that um, some disciples we have some strong evidence really did die as martyrs for their testimony about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, She also talks about the growth of the early church. I like that. And Mm -hmm. uh, again, answering the deists with Jesus is uh, right. Something I thought right. was cool because I'm a big Jesus guy. You know, that's my yeah, my main Her. area of interest. Yes. No, her, I think her number one argument for me that stuck out was her case for miracles Hmm. because she literally says she talks because, you know, a lot of people will say like Hume's argument that miracles go against the laws of nature, but she answers that so well that I'm like, 
oh, okay. Like I'll even like, let me look. There's, I have it bookmarked right here real quick because her case for miracles, I feel like for me was a big one um, because until she could give the case for miracles, she couldn't give the case for Christ because she, uh, you know, until you can prove that miracles can happen, how can you prove that someone who did them is the Messiah? Um, and so the one part where she says is she says, um, the argument for miracles is that the premise one is that no being can change the laws of nature or God's laws without God's consent. Uh, and that he cannot allow that they change to give evidence to falsehood. So because God is honest and true, you can't do anything. You can't create a miracle in order to prove a lie. Um, she says, therefore, a change in these laws is full evidence that what is delivered came from him. And she says, we call a change in the laws of nature a miracle. So basically, she says, look, no one can change God's laws. But if someone can, there's a purpose to it. It's the reason to show a truth. And it must mean that they are God as well, or that mm -hmm. they have the power of God in some way. And so she uses that as, yeah, you're right. You know, no being can change the, law, the laws, um, God's laws. But if they can, then you really have to start considering that person might be who they say they are. Mm. Um, and so because if they're doing it and they're proving a truth, then that's great. But they won't be able to do it to prove a lie. And so she's like, Jesus can't be claimed to be an imposter because he's not doing it to prove a lie. Um, and so I, I love her case for miracles. I felt mm. that it was really powerful. Yeah, that kind of harkens back to uh, the healing of the paralytic in Mark mm -hmm. 2 for me, because um, yep. I think there Jesus is doing a similar thing where he right. where he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then people say, he's blaspheming. Why is he talking like that? Only God can forgive sins. And then he says, so, <laughs> well, that, you may, <laughs> so that you may know that the son of man has authority yeah. on earth to forgive sins. I tell you, yeah. he says to the paralytic, get up and walk. And when he walks, people are saying, why would God allow this guy to heal if he was a blasphemer, right? Maybe he can forgive his sins because right. why would God let him do that? You know? Yes. Um, yes. And so I, I like that. That kind of goes back to even how Jesus was using evidence in, um, in Mark two. Mm -hmm. So if you were talking to somebody who wants to engage with their skeptical friends, neighbors, family members, or just people who see Christianity differently. Uh, what are some uh, little tidbits that we can take away from her work that could be useful in apologetic engagement? Um, I would say number one is listen and actually understand what their issue is before trying to answer it. Because what I've seen about her is that um, she's very well read, meaning that she read all of the challenges to the face. She read Matthew Tyndall's work extensively. I mean, she had, she was referencing page numbers of his. And so mm -hmm. she obviously knew the arguments that she was answering. And I feel like a lot of times as a, as apologists, sometimes we get just so excited about the things that we know, mm -hmm. and we love it so much that we kind of jump the gun a little bit. And we, and we just try to, um, like make our passion, make people want to be a Christian. And it's like, well, do you actually understand the specific things that they're struggling with? Do you actually know the, the, the true arguments that they're having? Um, because a lot of time, it could just be that they're just angry at God for something trauma, traumatic that happened in their past. Or, um, you know, we don't always know why they're motivated to not believe. And so I guess for me, my first question is always, well, why don't you believe? what, what is your hang up, you know, and then really try to, and then ask follow-up questions, really try to understand, well, okay, so what do you mean by that word? Or what do you, what do you, how do you, how does that make you feel or something like that? Because I feel like, I think that I, I hate using the word feel because I know as apologists we're told not to use it, but I also am like, but I also do feel this way. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that we also, like I was saying earlier, is that sometimes I forget that there's a person on the other side of the conversation and um, working with young kids has kind of trained me out of that a little bit because um, they're just so innocent and impressionable. I don't want to hurt them in any way. I don't want to um, hurt their hearts in any way. So, but I think a lot of times what happens is we, we try to answer the argument and not like when the person, you know, and, and I feel like that's something that we need to work on as apologists. So mm -hmm. I'd say number one, know exactly what you're trying to answer. Um, know exactly what their their deal is. Why don't why aren't they a believer? What what is it? And then number two, just remember there's a person on the other side of that conversation. Remember there's a heart 
that could be hurt um, and um, or just a lot of confusion and a lot of trauma in their past. And so just to be sensitive to, um, you know, not just winning the argument, but also winning the person too. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when you get questions that just sound like academic questions, we do just want to jump right on in and then share what we (laughs) know as the, like a prepared response to Mm -hmm. something like that. But to just to take a step back and and really ask that person, you know, of all the questions you could ask about God, right? why that one? And just listen to them and just get, get the intel, get the backstory and and get to know Mm -hmm. them as a person. Cause just like you would with, um, you know, a Muslim friend, you know, just because mm-hmm. you read a, a you know a little pamphlet on what Islam is about, it doesn't mean you understand what your friend believes. Exactly. Right? So yes, I mean, we need to hear that, hear the heart behind those questions, and uh, engage with like a, I like to say with courage and compassion. Right. Yes. So yeah, yeah I loved how she uh, defined her terms like truth, for example, a correspondence mm-hmm. theory of truth. Um, yeah. So there's good things we can take away from her. Um, yeah, her I'd actually say how that. To talk to I- others. I forgot that one, but the fact that I feel like that's one thing that I learned from her is, is that it's the importance of clearly defining your terms because we could throw out words like truth or doctrine or theology or justice. And I was like, well, okay, well, what do you mean by that? And not only does she define it, she like defines it in multiple ways over a whole page. She says, well, if this about this, then this, then if this about this, then this. And so she goes so specifically into these definitions of these words. And I think that that's important because sometimes you could be talking to someone about and using the same words, Mm -hmm. or is it using the same um, vocabulary, but not the same dictionary. And so the idea that you could be using the same words as somebody, but you're not really talking about the same thing. Um, I feel like that's something I learned from her that was, that was a big thing is, is make sure that you're talking about the exact same thing. Make sure you clearly define your terms um, and what you're talking about before you move on to the next thing. So, you know, Susanna Newcomb isn't somebody that a lot of people know about, but I don't want your work and your book to be something that a lot of people don't know about. I want people (laughs) to know about it. So how can people find out more about this book? No apologies. Um, It is on Amazon. So you could just go in and type in my name and it'll come up on Amazon. Um, I also have uh, a website, noapologiesbook.com. And on the website, it's really cool because all of the, um, as you'll have noticed, there are over like 500 footnotes, um, but all of the footnotes are actually hyperlinked on my website. So you can actually go to a tab and you can actually look at the footnotes and then it sends you to an article or um, a verse in the Bible or something that enhances that footnote of, in some way. So um, noapologiesbook.com has, it has pictures of my trip. It has um, the, the historical documents. It has our birth certificate. It's got all of those things um, on there. So um, I would say noapologiesbook.com. It also has a link to buy the book as well. So, um, and it has links to her original works um, that you can read in PDF format there. Well, that is great. Thank you so much for sharing that website. And uh, please do check out her website, or you can also type in her name into Amazon, Sarah Enterline. That's enter, like the word enter and line, like, just <laughs> yep. like the word line, Very enter simple. line, <laughs> just like it sounds. So thank you so much for being on the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. How cool was that to hear not only <laughs> about Sarah's story, but to find out about Susanna Newcomb, the very first woman to publish an apologetics book. And hey, if you found this helpful, please review the show on Apple Podcasts. It helps me know that I'm bringing topics and guests to you that are helpful and interesting, and it helps other Christians looking for an apologetics podcast know that they're in the right place when they read those reviews. Now, a new thing that I'm doing on the podcast is after our featured conversations, what I do is read one of your reviews. And today, uh, today's featured review from Apple Podcasts comes from JT. And JT says this, this podcast is for you, all caps, Y-O-U, exclamation point. Thanks, JT. Having already had an apologetics ministry for years before this podcast, Mikkel has obtained great wisdom and understanding about the Christian faith and how to communicate why it is true with love and clarity. This podcast will benefit anyone wanting to understand their own faith better, as well as those who are seeking truth wherever it may lead. Well, thank you, JT, for the kind comments and for posting that review on Apple Podcasts. I'm glad you're part of our community, and I hope that today's content helps you on the path to better uh, explaining your faith with courage and compassion. 
Well, thanks everyone for checking out the show today. Please do subscribe wherever you're listening to the show and share this episode with someone who needs to hear this today. I'm your apologetics guy, Mikkel, and until next time, keep the faith.